Hello everyone and welcome back to Creating Appealing Characters Week 2. This week we're going to focus on creating a functional base mesh for our characters, something strong that will carry our sculpts through for the rest of the eight weeks. So by now everyone has chosen a concept, hopefully, and we've narrowed it down to one. A good concept for this class is anything that doesn't rely too heavily on color, or texture work or anything that really doesn't show up well in a pure sculpt. Imagine that this character is going to be printed out as just a gray maquette to be placed on a desk or something like that. We need to be able to communicate everything that's important about this character in just the sculptural elements. Anytime I'm starting a new character project, the first step is always blocking out the character, right? It's like doing the rough sketch underneath. I want you to really spend some time on this because, in my opinion, it's the most important step to making a full-figured character. There's a saying that you can't polish a turd, right? So what that means is you can't really fix something that's fundamentally bad with multiple layers of snazzy sculptural doohickeys or anything like that. You can't start something that looks horrible and then just add poor level detail on top of that in order to fix it. So it's always going to look bad if at its very root it's uh, weak or poorly put together. So we're going to just go around that problem by creating a really strong base mesh that can carry our sculpt through all the way to the end. In other words, we want to start with something good, right? So starting with a good base mesh is just going to give us a good foundation. Uh, we won't be battling proportion or volume as we go. And also, we should be able to get some good reuse out of this for projects down the road. There's always a couple different ways that people like to start characters in 3D. Oftentimes you'll see people start from a Dynamesh sphere or something in ZBrush and just basically sculpt a character up from nothing. Another good way to work is by starting with good pre-existing topology and molding that into the character that you're creating. For this class, we're going to start from scratch. We're going to start with a very simple sphere in ZBrush, convert that to DynaMesh, and then block out the character as we go. And I'm going to be talking about the specific choices in shape that I'm using as I go along and how every piece of my base mesh corresponds to the overall look and feel of the character. We're going to focus a lot on getting the volumes and the curvatures of the limbs and stuff as correct as possible at this early stage. And then by the end of the eight weeks, we should have a fully posed, on-point character following the concept art that you see on the right. So for this first week, we're going to keep everything as basic as possible, just talking about straights versus curves, complex versus simple sides, thick to thin, and tapered shapes, and all of that sort of shape language stuff that we talked about in the first week. This is where all of that will be the most important. So with that said, let's jump into ZBrush and get started. Hey everyone, and welcome to week two of Creating Appealing Characters. So, this being the second week, everyone should have chosen three concepts that they'd like to try and make for this class. And we have decided on one for each one of you, or we will soon. Kind of decide uh, which one will be the best for you to work on for this class. Um, so, if you haven't chosen anything yet, things to keep in mind for a good concept. Um, don't choose anything too detailed or outside of your abilities as a modeler, right? I think that kind of goes without saying. Don't choose anything that relies too heavily on cloth or hair for texture or uh, for color information to, to really sell the character. So before we get started today, I want to talk about how I like to set up and manage reference when I'm working in ZBrush. So the first thing I'll do is go to my texture palette and then import my concept art that I want to work from. So click on that concept art that you imported and then click this little plus minus button. There you can see there. To add that to Spotlight, press the comma key to get rid of that light box that pops up there. So now I've got my concept image in Spotlight inside of ZBrush. You'll notice that it's got a transparent background. That's because I went into my concept art here and I changed the background in Photoshop to be a solid black. 
ZBrush treats any image that you import um, as transparent if it's solid black. So um, you'll notice also that if I scale this up, I've got a lot of artifacting on the edges and stuff here. That's just part of that sort of automatic alpha that is brought in here. But you can adjust it a little bit by going to your, on the uh, light box coin here, or the spotlight coin here, click uh, intensity. And then you can drag that around a little bit until you're happy with sort of what that does. And then before doing anything else, make sure you turn off intensity. Or oh, whoops, looks like I accidentally cranked that a little bit. There you go. Just turn off, just click it again to turn off intensity. And now you have a transparent image that you can move around however you like. And you're good to go. So from here, I will go ahead and save out my spotlight file for this whole project and I can reload this anytime I need it as I'm working. So this is the way I like to manage reference as I'm working in ZBrush. It's just nice to have your stuff up on the screen. Uh, you don't have to do ZBrush's transparent window or have it up on a different monitor or something like that. And you can hide it whenever you don't want to see it. One last note about Spotlight is that it will treat, Spotlight is designed for painting so it will treat any image that you have in here as a projection for any geometry that you're using. So it won't work very well if you're trying to use any brush that has RGB enabled or um, the smooth brush. So I will always go and turn off spotlight projection, which is a setting that can be found under brush, samples, and it's this option here, spotlight projection. If you turn that off, then it no longer treats spotlight as a painting tool and you can use your smooth brushes and any brush that has RGB enabled without using this image to project. All right, so that being said, let's move on to blocking out our sculpt. Okay, I'm gonna load in one more image here. Import my blocking guide. So what I did, let me just tile these two images here. So, all right, let me load this image in here and uh, compare. So what I did was I went into Photoshop and I just did a very simple draw over of the major forms that are, make up this character. Um, and specifically, each colored section of this is going to be a different object that I'm actually going to use in my base mesh. So I tried to think about how many different pieces I wanted to break this up into, initially at least, uh, to get the most efficient sort of workflow. Like, do I really need to go in and break this leg up into two pieces with an extra piece of geometry for the knee? That kind of stuff, you know, I'm not going to see her feet. Um, I have a separate object that I might use for my hands, uh, or the gloves, rather. So I'm thinking of pieces that I can reuse or pieces that I need to put a less amount of detail or effort into, at least in the beginning here. There's no sense in sculpting everything out if we're not going to see it ever. This is just sort of my roadmap or guide to all the different parts that I'm going to build in this base mesh. All right, so I'm gonna keep that kind of small on screen here. I don't really need it too much because I tend to build all my meshes similarly. I'm also going to scale down my concept just a little bit. Actually, let's keep that pretty big. And I am ready to start blocking out this character now. All right, so now we're ready to jump into the meat of actually making this character, right? We're going to actually start blocking out our base mesh now. So keeping in mind, so keeping in mind all of the concepts that we talked about all of the fundamentals and shape language terminology and stuff that we talked about in the first week, we're going to start putting this character together. Whenever I start a new character, I'll usually start it one of two ways. If I have a good topology, a base mesh pre-existing someplace, I like to use that to start because all of the edge loops, you know, have already been figured out for you. That structure is already built in. 
But for the purpose of this class, what I want to do is build everything from scratch so that I can really focus on the shapes and the forms that go into making this character and hopefully exhibit all of the types of stuff that we talked about in the first week. So I'm going to delete my subdivisions on this sphere and then go ahead and dynamesh this at a fairly low resolution. So everybody works differently in ZBrush of course and whenever I'm starting off something like this I tend to work as low as I possibly can with this character and that's because it's kind of like an insurance for myself so that I don't add detail unnecessarily. It's impossible to do when you're working at very very low resolutions. So I'm just thinking about the major structure of the torso and the pelvis rib cage um, areas as I sort of put these things together here and the way that I work too is I tend to try to get all the pieces in there before I focus too much on proportion or um, you know trying to nail the exact look of the concept I want to just get all this stuff represented for now you'll notice I tend to break everything up into a lot of pieces at this stage it's just easier for me to think that way you obviously can work however you feel comfortable I like to think of these early base meshes or base sculpts as uh, sort of like an action figure because I'm going to be scaling the different parts and moving them around all over the place so I want to make sure that I've given myself the flexibility to do that and sometimes when you go into program like ZBrush especially and really start cranking shapes around it becomes very very easy to start adding tons of detail a little too soon and then you get lost in that process and kind of lose sight of what the original intent was. If you get caught noodling, if you get stuck noodling, it's kind of hard to break out of that. So one thing I'll do periodically here, let's just get the whole legs in there. I'm not worried about the exact shape language yet. That will come. I just kind of want a general rough indication. These proportions will continue to evolve and change as we sculpt. I'm not planning on 100% nailing all of the proportions right off the bat. So the most important part for me right now is just getting all of these pieces in here. Just get it all in and represented and then we can go and tweak stuff around. It becomes much easier to make those adjustments once all the pieces are accounted for because you're going to have to use you know, the relative length and size of, of all the different limbs to measure the other parts of the body. Just a general size and shape to represent all the pieces and uh, you'll see it'll start to come together. So paying attention to my sort of road map up there, I like to have a separate object to represent the deltoids and shoulders just because that area gets very complex get some interesting kind of shapes especially on characters like this uh, lumberjack lumberjane lumberjack character 
she's got a little bit of muscle definition, quite a bit of muscle actually in her arms. So that shape is very distinct in the shoulder. It's probably my favorite thing to sculpt. So I like to keep that as just a separate object. Let's get some arms in there. Oh. Just copy these shoulders out. So you'll notice that this is all just one subtool still. And anytime that I'm copying um, an object, like you see I do there, I can duplicate anything that's unmasked. As long as you have no subdivision levels, you can duplicate any polygroup or object that's unmasked just by going to your transpose, holding down control, and then clicking that middle button to translate out that object. Yeah, that's a real quick and easy way to build up a big, or to build up your mesh quickly. So I'm keeping this all as one subtool for a while. I'm, I'll break it up soon enough, but this just allows me to work a little quicker than having a lot of different subtools that I have to constantly switch back and forth to. All right, now we've got, oh, we still needed some hands. So hands, like I mentioned earlier, part of the, you know, creating a character, like we mentioned week one, is being prepared. So I thought about each piece of this before I started actually sculpting here. You know, how am I going to make everything that's in here? I've got a good hand that I've modeled. If you've got a good hand somewhere that you've modeled, save that because that's just really useful. Really nice to have, you know, pieces like that that you can kit bash and reuse later. So I'm just going to kind of indicate a hand so that I've got a good idea of scale and gesture for that hand. So this is like a fist or uh, maybe a, a hand with no fingers, just for now. But it's in there, and I can use it now to measure against everything else. So the next thing I want to do before I start actually messing with proportions is if you look at my polygroups here, I've got a bunch of different polygroups, um, you know, because uh, I've got a lot of different objects in here. So one of the options that you'll notice in DynaMesh is this option to uh, preserve your groups or to group based or to DynaMesh based on groups. So now I want to break these groups up like I have in my roadmap. So if I isolate just these arms, you'll notice that um, you know I want these shoulders as separate just for now. But more importantly, I want to DynaMesh the top part of the arm with the lower part of the arm. So what I'll do is just auto groups this whole thing, get rid of those shoulders, and then group this you know the tops and bottoms of these arms as one polygroup and then I'll uh, group those shoulders as one polygroup I think there's two cylinders in that neck on accident so I'll just make sure that that's one polygroup it'll go away once I dynamesh it and the legs are uh, already one polygroup so now I'll just go in here run my dynamesh again to get nice even topology and uh, what the, by turning on preserve groups in DynaMesh now, I'm not actually uh, combining these pieces together, as you can see. There are everything that's its own polygroup stays as its own polygroup, which is why we made the arms one group so that we can just sculpt on them as a whole. Okay, so looking pretty wonky right now but all the pieces are are in and represented at least so we can actually start working on our proportions so let's do that now so now that we've got all of the pieces sort of put in here as haphazardly as uh, we have maybe you've done a better job of organizing your base mesh than I have here but um, that's okay because now I'm going to go in and actually start to shape this into um, a rough approximation of this concept here. 
So this week is all about just you know taking your time and making sure that you're starting with a good strong foundation. So getting your shapes to look right and getting your proportions blocked in as best you can because you want to do less of that. You want to do as uh, little of that later as, as you can, right? So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I am going to actually break this object up a little bit now so that I can hide pieces a little easier. So I'm going to split those arms off uh, and what the heck, let's color them a little bit just to keep track of the different objects. And I'm going to split these legs off. And we'll split the head off as well. Why not? Alright, so now we're ready to jump in. And I'm going to switch between these sub-tools um, just by alt-clicking on them. So the first thing I want to do is kind of, let's just do a quick comparison to our concept, which is easy to do since we've got it floating right here. Lower my opacity a little bit. So I'm going to kind of choose a landmark here, or just kind of the overall length of the torso. Overall length of the torso feels pretty good to me. If I were to go in here and, um, you know, grab the bottom part, of that torso and kind of swing it up like it is there in the concept we get something that's not really too far off so that's a good place to start I guess we got lucky there um, but what I'm gonna do now is just go around the entire mesh using very very simple tools inflate move, smooth, and the polish brushes to push and pull this object into shape. And as I do so, as I move, as I shape each of these limbs and body parts, I want to keep in mind those kind of core 2D fundamentals that we talked about in week one. So, using these legs as an example, just kind of smooth out the unevenness here. If I look at just these legs, I want to keep a much more interesting front sort of curvature to these legs, right? That's the silhouette. And then the back side, or a different way of thinking about this, is I've got a curve into a straight. And then kind of the reverse of that on the back side. I've got a straight along the back of the thigh and then a curve into the calf. And just that back and forth, straights and curves all the way through the body. Complex versus simple. I want these legs to overall have, you know, a, a nice taper to them. So I'll start to push and pull this mesh around until I start to get that feel. She's got some pretty thick legs, so they're not going to taper in too much, but there's still a lot of distance to go there. So if you're working from, most of you will be working from a concept that you're only seeing one angle of the character. And that's where all of our shape language and, and studying from last week is really going to come into play because you're going to have to start thinking about, you know, if I'm describing on the concept art here, I've got this curve that goes into a straight, and we'll just isolate the top of the leg, the thigh, for a second, and the front is kind of curved. It's so curve on one side, straight on the back. I want to make sure that that shape more or less translates as I go around. So if I go to my 3D, or my uh, sort of three quarters view, like the actual drawing is in, I've got that curve on the front, let me hide those arms for now. And I've got a relative straight on the back. Just kind of ignore that for now. So I've got that relative straight on the back, curve on the front. 
I want to make sure that that shape carries as I rotate this around. So you'll see that from all angles, the the right side of the leg or the this the straight side tends to always be the most simple side. Even as I go around to the front, this interior side of the form is much more simple and straight. The exterior side is going to have more of a curve to it. As I snap it to a side view, same thing. So I'm not breaking that curve up perfectly from top to bottom either. You'll notice that the apex of that curve is a little higher up on the form, not right there in the center. All right, I'm just going to push those knees back quite a bit. If we can get some of that sort of reverse that she's got in her leg in the neutral, that would be fine. So I've got anatomy reference that I pulled for this character and I'm looking at that kind of stuff as I go but the main thing I'm focused on right now is just getting these forms and volumes specifically to, uh, to work well. So let's do a quick comparison here if I kind of realign my torso. So I think what we could do is stand to um, make these legs a little longer. And we'll just go straight back into now pushing and pulling things around. One thing I like to do at this stage is sharpen up any breaks that I might have. I'm not sculpting too heavily yet. I just want to make sure that the breaks are clearly defined in these forms so that from any distance I can really see where that separation is. And that helps my overall readability. Same with on the back here. Thinking about how these shapes, the upper and lower leg, kind of slot into each other and rest on top of one another. Yeah, I'm not going to put too much into those feet because they're going to be covered with boots. But I want the feet to sort of represent the general volume and shape that the boot's going to have. And uh, just before I get too far into sculpting or detailing out any one area, I want to move on because definitely get in the weeds pretty quick if you stay in one, one sort of area on here. feet just to be a little bit more interesting I might a little bit more interesting a little bit more natural I'm just gonna turn those out slightly she might stand more like that now if I look at this from a dead-on perspective off on the side I can really take a look at these shapes make sure that I've got a nice curve on the front straight on the back curve on the back of the leg and then a really kind of simple straight I could clean that up a little bit on the front and then as I rotate this around I'm maintaining as much of that shape curve on the front straight on the back as I can and then uh, I'm going to say this many times but make sure to look at your model from top and bottom make sure that your forms are wrapping correctly what I mean by that is just making sure that you know nothing is getting flattened and you're not aware of it or um, or too kind of puffed out in any one area this is looking kind of awkward the intersection of the hips and the legs because I have not done anything with the the hips yet so that's a pretty good place to leave the legs for now I've got my general proportions are in there you know there's still some stuff I could do but I've touched those enough for now let's go and kinda of hit everything else in the body before we come back to those legs so I'm switching over to the body subtool now first thing I'm gonna do is just dynamesh all this stuff together you could spend some time further sculpting on and sort of blocking out these primary forms if you wanted to but I'm just gonna kinda of try to do it all at once so that we get through this whole mesh 
um, this whole uh, base mesh during this video. So one thing you'll notice maybe is that I started off by not working in symmetry on this. I had symmetry turned off on this subtool. So just real quick, I'm gonna go down here. Modify read topology, mirror and weld. So I've got perfectly mirrored symmetry. And I'll bring those arms back in because they're pretty important at this point. I might even space those out some. Switch back to my torso and then just working on the torso and the hips. We need to fill in quite a bit on the back here. Butts are always interesting, um, important area. So especially in animation, you'd be surprised at how much time you spend sculpting on butts because they got to move, right? They, they move a lot in animation, so we want to make sure that back and forth between rigging and modeling is as smooth as can be. So, yep, you'd be surprised, maybe some of you, just how much time I spend actually stressing out about how good a butt is that I've sculpted at work. That's what we're in it for, right? The glorious parts of the job. And even though this character will never move, uh, never be animated, I don't think, still have to worry about that a little bit. So I'm just kind of, for my own reference here, blocking in some real simple anatomical structure uh, you know, where do I want, like, the hit of um, that rib cage right there? That's an important piece that I need to have, you know, this distance between where that hit is and the bottom of the bust line is uh, really important. So that sort of whole rib cage structure is something I need to get blocked in here pretty quick. Or not quick, take your time with it, of course. And just remember, this the mantra of this class, and any time that I do any work at all, um, my sort of mantra is uh, that everything looks terrible until it doesn't, right? So you got to keep going on this stuff, pushing and pulling and trying new things. You know, rely on your reference and rely on your, your knowledge of form, all the stuff we talked about week one, and it will start to it will start to come together. So I'm not getting into any kind of specific anatomy or anything here. I just want to make sure that my sort of hourglass torso shape that she has is represented. All of this stuff is going to change again. As we sculpt, things will, things will move around. But the purpose this week is just to create a good, strong foundation for myself. I don't want to be second-guessing proportions too much. Switch over to these arms start to incorporate those deltoids and just kind of have a uh, not I have not by any means a definitive knowledge of how anatomy inserts and intersects and and uh, or what's the word I'm looking for the origins and insertions of, of muscles but I've got a good sort of functional reference in my brain that helps at least get this stuff blocked in looking somewhat convincingly. Um, I'm going to turn on topological with my move brush so that I only affect areas that are kind of polygon islands and uh, grab these arms. So one thing I like to do is make sure that my arms are snapped along um, if you hold down shift when you're moving this transpose line, it'll snap in, I think, 15 degree increments. So if I have my arms kind of snapped along one of those meridians, it becomes a lot easier to, uh, to work on them, like if I needed to scale them out or scale them down or anything like that. So just kind of, let's try moving them out some. I don't really want to do the T-pose too much, and you'll notice that her arms aren't exactly at a T. I don't really gain anything by doing that. So let's go for, you know, maybe like a, a 45. 
So now I've got those arms perfectly at a 45, which is nice because you'll notice it's just very easy to use transpose now to make big adjustments. Let's go back over here. Let's keep working on this torso. So here's my shape, my torso or rib cage shape that's happening underneath there. And then I've got my box of my pelvis down there too. Pull that out a little bit. Maybe pull these legs out a little bit. I'm getting like uh, speed skater legs going on. It's not really what I want. So we'll just knock those back a little bit. We'll find a nice flow in there. Yeah, all right. A little flat butt here, so let's kind of pull that out some. I'm going to hide those arms again. So we can really pull that out and, uh, you know, get this nice sort of curviness coming down through the torso to the butt and then into the leg so we get this sort of rhythm going through the body this snaky s shape kind of rhythm if you really sort of simplify that you should have something that feels kind of natural we're not quite there yet so i'm going to keep pushing and pulling stuff around switching to different sub tools when i need to okay and just eliminating any kind of real solid anatomy in here. Don't even want to worry about that yet. Keep it as simple as possible for as long as possible. So I'm going to work on these arms now and really just try and get some of that volume back in there. If I do another sort of comparison with my concept art, line up the, clav the clavicle down to the crotch is kind of how I'm doing my comparison there. Those arms are very, very skinny and uh, possibly need to move that whole arm up a little bit. I'm going to break those hands off and polygroup those separately. Go ahead and color those. guess this would be a good time to save sometime before the character is done. Alright, now let's work on some of the shapes of this arm. So I want to pull back this kind of tricep area. I know that if we look at this arm as a tube, and forgive the weird broken elbow going on there, but if we look at just this area, the upper arm, we want to get that nice diametrically opposed kinds of angles that kind of occur naturally in the anatomy there, but we can definitely plus up with our shapes, and it's something that I tried to do here in the concept art too. So if I blow this up a little bit, you know, I'm looking at the contour of this bicep and the contour of the triceps on the back. I've got one hit here in the front, sort of a plane break where that bicep turns and goes into the elbow. And then I've got a hit on the back of the arm that's further up. So when we look at them from the side, if I were to just kind of try to mimic that shape, I've got the front of the arm, the hit of the bicep, and then down into the elbow. And in the back of the arm here, we've got the hit of that tricep and then up into the deltoid or uh, the shoulder, right? So I'm going to do, I'm going to attempt to do that same thing here in the sculpt by just making, if I look at this curve on the back, the apex is high up towards the shoulder. This curve on the front, that apex is down towards the elbow. And I'm trying to do that back and forth everywhere on this whole mesh, this whole model as I go. Something I'm always trying to keep in mind is avoid parallels whenever possible because they have a tendency to kill your design or the flow of your model. Time to fix this elbow. Something horrible has happened to it. She's all mangled before I even got to start really. So keeping my interesting side here. She's really got some guns, so I want to make sure that I'm not going too small in the volume. I have a tendency to do that often when bringing stuff into 3D. I see that happen a lot too, translating concepts from a drawing into 3D. It's very easy to lose the volumes. And that's the main thing that we want to focus on. That's one of the main things 
I should say, that we want to focus on during this week is just getting those volumes in that nice interplay of complex and simple straights versus curves all the way through. And then uh, I like to go through and, like I said before, just take a mechanical sort of brush like Dam Standard or um, these mech brushes that I got from Zebra Central and really carve in my junctions of forms, you know, upper arm into lower arm happening right there. Where's that hit, that bicep hit happening right there? And then tricep hit happening further up on the back side. There's always a, a diagonal relationship between these types of shapes. Just really overemphasize some bony landmarks like the elbow. Make sure that that's not too low on the arm, a little low. And kind of plane out this lower arm area. It's really kind of resembles a block most of the time. With these sort of muscular masses attached to it. So I'm keeping in mind, using these arms as an example, I've got one side that's more complex and curved, one side that's a lot more simple and straight and kind of becomes the line of action for that limb. I'm uh, definitely making use of tapered shapes as I go. So everything tapers and nothing is parallel. And same goes for the legs here. Everything has got a more interesting curvature to it. Yeah, so avoid parallels and keep that nice relationship between straight and curve in all of your forms through the whole body. And then make sure that no one limb is a total island. You know, I'm making sure that the silhouette of that leg is intersecting with the silhouette of this body in a way that makes sense. This is kind of an area that I'll need to clean up some. You'll see. But that's why we're uh, taking our time and just going through and really doing a nice, clean job of, of blocking this out as, as best we can. And you don't have to keep everything separately, or uh, you don't have to keep everything as separated out as I do. But I find it very useful to me to be able to have uh, arms and head and stuff at different resolutions as I go. Speaking of head, we're not going to do too much on that today, but just get some general proportions and some planarity into it. I'm going to have a whole, a whole lot of time to talk about the head and face because obviously that's, in my opinion, the most important part of the character because it will definitely be what everybody looks at first. So whether you're, no matter what type of character you're working on, hopefully it's got a face. That, sh that should have been in the syllabus for this class, the prerequisite for every character design that you work with from. Must have a face. So we've planed out a head that we can use. Maybe it's a little high up. Boop. There we go. So even the neck, not even a total parallel. I want to have a nice angularity to that from both sides. I'm going to isolate this so that I can pull up these traps a little bit. Just push those out into the shoulders. She got some broad shoulders. Uh, so you'll notice that I started on these shoulders without symmetry on again. That's all right. Let's just make one of them. Get the 
the shape that I want. So I know that on the back she's going to have this scapula that's shaped kind of like this and uh, this deltoid shape sort of attaches along the upper spine of that scapula and then it also inserts on the inside of that clavicle here. So I'm just kind of representing that pretty loosely with this object here. The main reason that I have this in here is to really just fill volume and to create a versatile shape that I can manipulate pretty easily later. I might actually combine this in with the rest of the arm now. Uh, I don't really need it to be a separate object anymore. But first, let's mask off that side and uh, do a smart resim under deformation. That's done. So now I've got two arms that are the same arms. Great. Uh, those hands should be a little bigger, so I'm going to scale them up. Make sure to turn on symmetry again. Scale those hands up. Move them back over. So hand scale is going to make a huge difference in the overall size of this character. You'll notice she's got pretty large hands which make her feel maybe not quite as tall or huge as she normally would. Um, at least to me, to my eye. We want to, any kind of visual cues that we can get going from the, from the get-go here. Let's just simplify this overall arm shape. Getting a little complex and wavy. All right, that's a pretty good place to to stop blocking those arms for now. I'm going to do some work on the legs. I feel like these knees could be pulled out some. Yeah, let's try that. Or like these whole the whole leg I just really blur the crap out of that mask. The whole leg could be rotated out just a little bit, give her a slightly wider stance. I'm going to turn off perspective and try to flatten those feet again. I really don't like those feet yet. All right, so let's fix our speed skater thighs I've got going on here. Kind of pull that up, maybe push some of this back a little bit. Again, I don't want to lose too much volume at this stage because from here on out we'll be, you know, sculpting a lot of this stuff away. It feels okay to me. It's got some pretty big thighs, so I think that's fine for now. Yeah. Something like that feels good. And we'll know a little bit more about it once we start to get some of those other pieces in here, like the clothing and all of that stuff makes a big difference. But uh, for now, I guess we, well, not quite finished. Let me just kind of put some final work into the neck and shoulders. I am going to go ahead and combine my arms together. I'll leave the hands out. So I just polygrouped this into one polygroup. Now I'll go into my DynaMesh with groups turned on, remesh that. And I've got that stuff is all dynameshed together now. 
And let's go ahead and add some volume on here for her chest. Just insert sphere, perfect tool for that. Insert sphere comes in, comes through for me again. Insert sphere and the move brush are my favorite tools in ZBrush. I wish I had some cool super super brush that I could tell people about the key to all of my successes in my life, but I don't. It's just the move brush, it's just a really good tool. My favorite thing about the move brush and why I think it's such a great tool is that you use it to tell polygons where to go and then they go there. And it doesn't get much better than that. So here's a good example of I've added this volume in for the breasts here and I see where this break for this rib cage is and it's too low or way too high I mean so now I can fix that might be getting a little wide in the torso here too so now I can fix that And I'll just dynamesh that stuff together. And use my mech cut to kind of clean up the uh, plane breaks. Add some plane breaks here and there. And there's a lot left to do on this, but. I'd say as far as a base mesh goes, as a block out first pass uh, for the body, we're in a pretty good spot. There's still some stuff here in, in these legs I'm kind of unhappy with, but we'll get to them when we actually jump in and start sculpting on these legs next week. All right, so there's our base mesh, and we're ready to go in and start meticulously detailing out everything else, but just a quick recap, you know, keeping in mind, I know I'm, I'm going to say this a million times, you're going to get really sick of it, but it's so easy to forget. Keep in mind a very simple side and a more complex side. Uh, make sure that everything has some sort of taper to it, uh, getting wide to small or uh, thick to wide to narrow, thick to thin, and uh, nothing is parallel anywhere. Rotate around from all over the place. You know, look at your model from, from bottom and top. Make sure that there's at least, you know, some sort of a nice distributed balance through your whole mesh, through your whole character here. Uh, one thing that's real handy is if you just go into transpose, make sure you turn symmetry on, and just with a really wide move brush you can push and pull stuff around to get a you know this is how I would get more of a gesture to this character maybe fix some of these proportions as well but just going through with this wide move brush and pushing and pulling these large shapes around to like get them to do what I want. Yeah, so now we've got a little bit more of a kind of a thrust forward gesture, which I like. I think that fits this character nicely. So we'll go back to our sub tools. All right, we're ready to rock with the sculpting next time. Okay, so just a recap of what we kind of did today and the main things to keep in mind as you're blocking out your base mesh. 
So this is after a couple more minutes of just kind of going over and sharpening up plane breaks and just cleaning up some sort of wobbliness that was happening, especially in the legs and stuff like that. But you'll notice that I try to keep, you know, tapered shapes happening wherever I can. You know, uh, even these arms, these length of arms aren't totally parallel all the way down. Uh, I've got one side that's very, very simple here on the inside. I've got one side that's much more complex here on the outside. And uh, I want to make sure that as I rotate around to different angles, that that same message is being carried across every piece of this character. So, you know, where I've got a apex of a curve on this thigh here. I want to make sure that as I rotate that around that that same apex, that same sort of shape is happening everywhere. It's a consistency. I want to make sure that every shape that I sculpt looks like, you know, it's distinct enough that it can be recognize kind of from every angle, right? So that's like the the challenge in making any character in 3D from a drawing. Making sure that it feels like the same character from every angle. And that's exactly what we're doing and it works down to the micro level. You know, there's a lot more we could do at this point, but this is a great place to start. One thing I might do is jump into another mesh that I have and just uh, appropriate some limbs here. Bring them back over to my base mesh. And I've got some hands that I can use. If you have some good meshes laying around somewhere with good topology, something useful use that stuff because doing hand topology on a character or sculpting fingers on a character every single time you make something is the worst and we don't want to do that yeah so maybe I can use these great uh, if you don't have good hand topology somewhere no problem, you can build it. Anyway, so there's some hands that I can sculpt around to do what I want with. Yeah, having this nice low res structure for these hands is very useful if I ever need to get in here and, you know, do some tweaks. It's uh, much easier with that structure built in. So hands are one thing that I will always kit bash and reuse if I can because they are a character unto themselves as you will see in one of the later weeks here. Alright so I'm gonna call that good for our base mesh. Um, I've got all my volumes blocked in. I'm pretty happy with a lot of the shapes that are happening. You know everything is very low res right now nothing is finalized uh, you know repeat that mantra everything looks terrible until it doesn't but we're we're making informed choices as we're building up this character and it's going to pay off down the road so hopefully you got some good info out of this week and you're ready to and hopefully excited about jumping in and starting on your own character and I can't wait to see them So that's it for this week. The homework is to do what I did here. Just jump in, block out your character, be smart about the shapes that you're using, you know, the amount of detail that you're putting into the character at this point. Keep everything as low and simple as possible. Always err on the side of under detailed, but you know, with, with reason. So best of luck and I'll see you next week.